Yeah, February 14th comes with a frenzy. It's Valentine's Day. And we'll be talking about issues surrounding this. Thank you for coming on the program, Dr. Gunter May and Dr. Simi Arabi. It's a pleasure to have you both with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Pamela. Good morning. Good morning. Now, Dr. Simi, if I can just kick off with you. What are the aspects? of sexual and reproductive health that teenagers should be aware of? I think it starts from actually understanding their bodies and understanding that comes from the home. That's where it starts from, is by your parents actually being open from when you were very young to teach you what your body parts are, using the right language. And as you grow older, to understand that the changes that come with your hormonal surges are normal and they are to be expected. So there's nothing shameful about those hormonal changes. So with girls, when you then start to develop sort of breasts and hair under your armpits or have your periods, those are normal. And with boys, the same thing. And then also you're having um, wet drains and all of that. Those are normal as well. So understanding that that is normal. And then understanding where to ask for advice and what to ask for advice for. Um, so in terms of things like contraception or if there's any uh, diseases or any infection, to know what to do. And most, I think lastly, but most importantly, is to understand consent. So what's right, what's wrong uh, in terms of relationships, where there is signs of abuse, which children may not know, may might think is normal, and to try and understand that is what I will, I will say were the main things. No, we just need to sort of dive into this. Culturally, you know, there's just a lot of silence around this topic because people believe that if you don't talk about it, nothing is going to happen. And the opposite is happening. So what do you know, parents and guardians need to know? How can they start these conversations? Yes, I mean... Is that uh, okay? Uh, thank you, Dr. Sine. Uh, I, I just wanted to actually pop in here. Um, I always have this way of, of introducing this topic to people that there are actually two biological imperatives for every living organism, including us you must eat, you must reproduce. Every other thing, it's something you can get by, but those two. Uh, imperatives. So the context has always been that culturally, even though we know this is something that has to happen, we, we shy off it because we think that if we talk about it, it's going to make the children promiscuous. But unfortunately, like uh, Dr. Pamela said, uh, that biologic imperative actually makes them want to do what we think they should shy off. So it's always very important to try and have that conversation and make sure that they do actually do understand their body, like Dr. Sylvia said, and what are the things that drive them towards that. Knowledge is power in this case, and uh, the more we actually give them that knowledge, the better it is going to be for them. Dr. Simi? Yes, I mean, that's... I was very excited to dive into the cultural aspect and the silence around it. I mean, this is a global behavior. Um, it's worse, obviously, in Nigeria, where we we have the religious aspect as well, where they say you have to be celibate, um, don't do anything. Anything that has to do with sex is, is an abomination. Mm -hmm. And so it's shrouded in secrecy. Um, it's happening. It's always been happening, and it will continue to always happen. So it's, it's, it's something that we have to stop as parents. We need to be very open with our children and we need to let them understand that this is not anything shameful because this is what then goes on to cause problems as they get older. So culturally speaking, I would encourage parents or anyone in a position of um, guardianship over a young person to, to normalize these conversations. It's, it's normal. We're doctors here. For us, it's anatomy, it's biochemistry, it's physiology. And we should make it a normal conversation in the household and give children the access to the care that they need and deserve. And, and it's a right for them to have. 
Well, I think, you see, it's, it's very easy for us to talk here, but in the cultural setting, in the womb, I mean, it is, you know, they go to church on Sunday, everybody pretends, they go to the mosque, everybody pretends. And you and I know that a lot of children are having sex a lot earlier now, but everybody is pretending and, and doing as if, as if, uh, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, and, and the evil doesn't exist, playing the ostrich. But the reality is that schools are initiating children, social media, there's just so much that, so much information that they're getting from the wrong sources. How can we, you know, what, what should we do? How can we, you know, as it were, convince people that it is better to talk about it than not to talk about it? Particularly since our own cultural norms are like are, are so strong. Uh, I, I even think that it's actually worsening the the the, the, the situation because um, it's 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 human curiosity. If you tell me not to do something, especially in those early years that I'm going up and I'm exploring the world, it is something that I want to do. So I think both our churches or, or religion, let me put it that way, because it's not really about churches, you know, it's even it's even cultural that we should we should, we should learn to be more open. It doesn't mean that you're actually encouraging your children to have sex. It's actually about letting them know that these urges will come. It is natural, but it is your decision. Like Dr. Simi said, mm -hmm. consent. It is your decision to make sure that you do this at the time that you want to do it. It's, it's, it's one of the most intimate things that anybody can do, giving your body to another person. So you must be ready. But being ready does not mean that you must shy away from the knowledge that these are the things that are happening. When they happen to you, it's normal. You don't need to go out and experiment on it because that's what a lot of a lot of young people do. It's experimentation. And like you rightly said, the social media is not helping matters. All sorts of things are being bandied about. The other day I was, I, I think we've spoken about this earlier before, in which uh, people were talking about uh, having sex to prevent uh, prostatic hyperplasia. And, and and there was a there was a social media uh, thing that was going on about another four or five days ago, in which somebody was actually really talking about it that as a man you need to have sex twenty one times in a month so that you don't have prostatic hyperplasia. <laughs> and it's like and these things that these young people listen to and they buy and they want to experiment. So I think it's it's actually the use of as parents and and uh, and, and cultural. Uh, champion to try and be more open to these children. Let them know what their body is about. Let them know what this thing is all about. It is something that has to truth. happen. Yeah. Yes, let them know the truth. It's something that has to happen, but at the same time, it's something that you can control when it happens. It's your choice. I want to talk about what you mentioned, Dr. Pamela, about the cultural side and the churches and mosques and all this other. It's very sensitive to bring up with those organizations and in terms of asking them to talk about it and educate the children in a way that is healthy. Because sometimes you hear them say, don't do it. Abstinence is the only way. And abstinence is not the only way. So how do we as healthcare professionals start to advocate within religious organizations and say, look, this is causing problems. I mean, I did research, I think my, my last year research in medical school in Unilag College of Medicine was on this topic. It was on uh, contraception in university students. Um, and we used Yaba Tech as a sample site. And all the la young ladies were using uh, emergency contraception. So they were uh, and termination. That was their mode of contraception. Nobody was on the pill. Nobody was on an implant or a coil. Um, nobody had the injection, the depot. They were all using um, the popular, I wouldn't mention the brand name, emergency contraception th then and still now, and termination and backdoor termination, causing sepsis, causing infertility, causing death. So we have to find a way of encouraging powerful, because religion is very powerful in this country, in Nigeria. How do we get the leaders to say, look, we need to save our children? 
for maybe perhaps one of the things we could do is talk about some of the potential risks with um early teenage sexual activity. What are the kind of risks that the teenagers we'll just start off with the young ones because they are experimenting now earlier and earlier. And as we said, a lot of parents, grandparents, people just simply don't know. What are the kind of risks that they're experiencing? I, I can take that question as well, if that's if that's okay. Yes, I, we we have to go back a step. One of the where we need to go back to is abuse, sexual abuse. So in Nigeria, we know it's really high high incidence of sexual abuse. So what is potentiating the risky behavior when these children then get to 10, 11, 12, and they go to boarding school? We have to then go back to because we don't talk about the issues at home, they don't even know what abuse is. So the neighbor calls them to the house, they go because they, they've been said, they've been told that the neighbor is also family. Okay, nobody's told them about what should not be done. So we need to actually go back to that. That's a big, a really big issue because the experiment, experimentation behavior you see is caused by trauma. It's not because these children just want to go out there. They've been, they've been made to feel sexual activity is a taboo. They've been made to feel their body is some sort of dangerous thing that they're carrying around, you know? So so people are, take advantage of that. And children are cu naturally curious, as Dr. Ogintman said, if, if you say don't do something, they're going to want to go and find out what it is. So I'm going to, I'll keep saying that the, the behavior of the children, I, I can never blame the, I'm, we're not doing that here. We can never blame the children. It's the adults that are the problem. We are the problem. We are the ones not getting it right on how to teach them. Because if a child is taught well from home, when they see social media sh you know, shenanigans, things that are not ready, recognize it as not something that they want to align with. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and just to buttress that, so I, I, I think part of it now also devolves on we adults. When they talk to us, we should not shame them. We should not make it as if they're doing something wrong because that's part of the problem again. They're afraid to actually talk. We should be open and guide properly instead of trying to tell them that it's wrong, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. It's, it, 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 it's more of a double whammy for them. They are trying to tell you, ask, tell you what is happening to their body. You are actually telling them that they are wrong to even think about it. And so they hide and seek advice from their, from their, from their peers and, and they do all sorts of things. So again, I, 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 we, we just have to just have to as adults take the responsibility that we are the ones who have to guide them right in whatever it is they do. Thank you very much. Now it's been you know now it's been you know uh, very heated during this break session, and the reality is that um, there's a lot around this subject that needs to be addressed. Consent is one. How important is consent? Consent is everything. Consent is everything. And I've spent so many years trying to explain to young boys in particular what consent means. And there's so much confusion. So there's a lovely video on YouTube called Tea and Consent. So for anyone who doesn't understand what consent is, please watch that video. It would really explain it to you. Consent is, is both ways. So as uh, whoever is engaging in any sexual activity can decide that they want to, and it has to be clear and overt. It can't be under the influence of any drugs or alcohol or anything. Uh, the age has to be important. There's so much around consent, but they, can, but they can also say they don't want to get involved anymore, even if the, the activity has started. So at any point, the person says, I'm not interested, then, there's no consent. So you cannot say, oh, you led me on. You were the one that pushed me to it. And oh, why did you come to my house? If you were, whether they came to your house, they came to your, wherever you are, anybody can decide. They don't want to go ahead at any time. And then also an adult cannot say that a child gave consent. Because one of the common things in our society as well is that we have older people abusing children. So you'll see a 25 year old, mostly the men, I'm, I'm not, not pointing out the men, but women do it as well. But mostly it's an older man 
with a younger child, male or female. And they say, oh, the girl is mature. The girl, we had the video the other time of, of a popular comedian and all these terrible comments that were being made on her page. She's only 13 or 14. Oh, she looks ready. And no, that is, there's no consent there. Even if the child said, yes, I want to do this with you, they, they, don't, they cannot give consent um, at that age. And for me, 18 is a is a hard line. I know that our law says different, but you can't really give consent. So consent, tea and, tea and consent is a good one. Please go watch it if you're not sure what consent means. Um, but it has to be clear, it has to be objective, and it has to be on the same even playing field. You can't be on a position of power and making a child do what they, they're not supposed to do, but they don't know that they can't give consent at that age. I don't know if that makes makes sense. No, it certainly does. And also because of the, the, we're talking about age and we're talking right now about teens. So we are talking about younger children and younger children who are being coerced into sexual activity or who are volunteering into sexual activity, not understanding issues to do with consent. I'm not even sure parents understand these issues to do with consent because, you know, back in the day, it was like, ah, this person is saying how to get and all this type of thing. And ah, no, you know, no means yes or, you know, all that, you know, needs to be cleared up. Dr. Bintame, you were saying. Yes, uh, uh, I actually agree with what Dr. Sidney has said. The, the, the problem simply is that uh, at a certain age, I think it's 18 also in Nigeria, you are not mature enough to say yes, irrespective of whether you are actually say yes to the to the older man. And and you don't have actually have to apologize for that of the city. It's actually the older man that you fault in most cases. You can't can't say yes. And I, I think a lot of us need to a certain legal age, it started to rewrite. So we can't force young girls to have sex with us because they look matured. If they look matured in body, they don't look matured in their, in their, in, in their, uh, in their uh, thinking faculty. And like we rightly said earlier, the context is always that they want to experiment. So if you, if you give them the, the, uh, the temptation to do it, they will do it. So I think it's, it's, it's very, very essential that we know that there must be consent, and the consent must be total. There is no halfway about consent. So uh, I, I, I think a lot of us needs to take that on board, and it affects both male and female, but mostly the male and the elderly male. We are the Thank ones you. who are mostly at fault. Thank you. No, I think that's very important. But a lot of um, sexual activity, as you said, goes on between teenagers, particularly in the school environment and all that. And if there are children or teenagers who are experimenting that need to to actually, and they're interested in contraception or interested in seeking advice for testing on sexually transmitted diseases because they know about them, because of course they're watching all these uh, videos and they've heard about what's going on and they know the changes in their body and they Google this. What can they do in this environment? I mean, I know that in the UK they have special places. Yes, I mean, there, there is a lot that can be done. I mean, my special interest is in women's health, uh, as you know. And I remember the first cultural shock I got in the UK was when three 12-year-olds appeared at Royal Free Hospital while I was on call uh, in the morning looking for um, some sort of emergency contraception. They had been out, three of them, and they had had sex together, three of them, and they were 12. I, I couldn't believe it. But we treated them with respect. We gave them whatever they needed and we handed them over to their GPs and made sure it was safe for them. So in, in this environment, I don't think, um, I think children need to be treated with that sort of dignity as well. So whether they've um, gone out to experiment or whatever they've done, they need to have places to go. And now we have primary healthcare centers that are developing and they're quite good. I mean, I have been to my local primary healthcare center myself and they are quite good. You know, we, there is a few bits to develop in our public system, but it's there. So they can ask. There, also, there are also non-governmental organizations that work with the government. You know, we have people like uh, the, the Hello Lagos Project, the Yedi, you know, and they are in different hospitals as well. 
So it's not it's not how it should be because in the UK you don't even have to appear. The kids don't even have to appear. They can just get something a test done private. They pick it up from the GP surgery or wherever. They put their sample in it and they post it off and it comes back anonymous. Nobody needs to know. You know, same thing with contraception. It's very anonymous. So what I'm hoping for that in Lagos at least and Nigeria is that we can get to that point where we can give children dignity. So even if they decide to engage in sexual activity, that we can treat them with dignity because they haven't done anything that is absolutely wrong. They've just done what they feel was right for them well, at the you time. Know, that's what you're saying, but I have to play the devil's advocate. I have to tell you that as a mother or as a grandmother, you hear your 12-year-old daughter is going out, taking, getting contraception and take, getting tested for sexually transmitted diseases. Some people will pass out. I don't know. How do we deal with this in the cultural context? Also, Dr. Guntemay, how do we handle this? I, 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 I think in this particular case, we, it actually devolves on, 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 on us health workers. Uh, there is no way you could explain that on a cultural level to any patient. It's just not done. It will, it will, they won't even listen to you. So I, I'm glad Dr. Sini mentioned uh, the primary health care system because when I, I, I borrowed that when from the UK, the idea of the working clinic and, and one of those things that uh, I was doing then was to encourage my primary health care uh, clinics to have a sort of uh, working places where people can work and not only children alone to try and access all these things. But here is the problem. And I think this, again, like I said, has to go back to us health workers. We judge. And I think that's a cultural problem. We have to stop judging because every time a young girl or a young male walks into those clinics, the looks that he or she will be given by the nurses and the doctors and whoever it is is there, knowing, ex knowing that this particular place has actually been dedicated towards trying to solve this problem drives them away. So on, 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 it's an appeal on air to our health workers to try and have an open mind when the uh, when they when, when when these people come on to them to know that what they're actually doing it's a health service and we have to make it anonymous and i think that's that's actually the key to it to try and make it as anonymous as possible make them feel protected when they come in make them feel that whatever question or, or request that they're going to make we are not going to have a contrary view about them rather that we're going to educate them and I think gradually we'll make it because I know that a lot of these people do this thing clandestinely. They prefer to go to this one man, one uh, laboratories in which they regularly do their test, try and say they are safe and they are not safe. And unfortunately, they encourage them to actually partake in unprotected sex. But then we have to make it formal and it has to be from the health sector, really. I mean, this is... Uh... I mean, this conversation is not an easy conversation. Time is already up. We haven't even addressed critical issues like all these LGBTQ that people are not even aware of. Uh, parents, you know, are not even aware of the trends and things and paths that are going on online. So can I then just ask you just to say just a few last words for our listeners. Who are the parents, the grandparents, the guardians that we actually that are actually listening to this program? Um, Dr. Uh, Simi, would you like to say a few words first? And, or Dr. Guntime? Yeah. And Dr. Simi, after. Last first for our listeners. Okay, so um, and I'll go ahead and say a few last words if you want me to go ahead. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, I mean, it's it's been an absolutely wholesome conversation. And I like what you said about you know the, the other trends around things like LGBTQ, sexuality. I mean, we that's a whole bigger conversation you know, to have and maybe this might not be the time to go deeply into it but what I want to say and encourage the adults is that it is our responsibility to teach our children it's not our responsibility to judge them but it's our responsibility to give them all the information they need to be able to make an educated and informed decision as they get older and if they make mistakes that will still embrace them 
and correct them in love. We're not going to start beating them or start, I mean, I've seen some videos that are terrible. We should not abuse children because they've participated in sex and all of those sorts of things. We should make these things available. If they get pregnant and they want a termination, have a conversation with them. There's loads of conversations to have. It's healthcare, it's natural, whatever they're going through is normal, it's biological, it's not their fault. Let's just embrace them and look after them like we're meant to do. Thank you. Dr. Buntamay, uh, last word. Uh, uh, same, same, same thing Dr. Senior said. I think it's to, it's, it's to the parents. Please let us understand that sex and sexuality is not a sin. It's not a taboo. It is something natural that will occur. And our best bet is to try and make sure that we guide our children onto the right path of it. It's not by denying the existence of it. It is there. They will do it. It's curiosity. There's nothing we can do about that. But we can make it safe for them. We can make it healthy. And I think that is what we should strive to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. Please like, share and subscribe for new video updates.